Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to News Dose, and th this is just complete insanity by this point. Of course, last week, as we talked about then, the FTC filed a new accusation against the Microsoft Activision Blizzard acquisition. And, and truthfully, as I said then, I don't think that they're completely wrong this time. But here we are today, and apparently, that's not the only battle that Microsoft faces. Now, unfortunately for us, it never ends. And by this point, I think it's starting to get a little bit pathetic. But we're going to get into all of that today and this new filing that goes against the Activision Blizzard buyout. Now, we also got some more information regarding Concord and its future. I'm not going to necessarily say that it has a good future, but we got a better outlook for what's going on with that game and some of the anticipation around it. And I'll just kind of say that things keep getting worse for Sony and Concord. So stay tuned for all of that as well, but let's just go and get right into things, starting off with a couple of remasters that leaked in a rather surprising way. So this is for Soul Reaver 1 and 2, and what happened here is that there were some Soul Reaver statues on display at a SDCC convention. Now, that's not necessarily a big deal or anything, or at least that's what you would think at first glance, but upon further inspection, it seems like somebody didn't get the memo and they revealed some information a little bit early. If you look at the card that's on display right in front of these statues, interestingly enough, it says very clearly, Soul Reaver 1 and 2 remastered. So, I mean, somebody must not have been aware that it's not been announced yet. Uh, but honestly... If you actually think about it, it you know, this does kind of make sense. The Embracer Group acquired these games when they bought out Crystal Dynamics, and this is something that they've done a lot with their buyouts. They've remastered a lot of games, such as SpongeBob Rehydrated, Destroy All Humans, and even the recent Tomb Raider remasters. So this does kind of play into their strategy, and for that matter, I think that these are actually really cool games to revive. They're old enough that they're basically going to be brand new games for a lot of people. Uh, the first game launched way back in 1998, but the people who have played them often gives them very high praise. So hopefully these remasters will justify that praise and both groups, new and old, can enjoy them, assuming that they're actually in the pipeline and, and that this wasn't just some kind of weird odd mistake. I mean, it would be very odd for them to randomly put this on a card, so I don't think that this is a mistake. I believe this is legitimate, but if it gets announced sometime soon, I would maybe look at Gamescom for a potential reveal. That is next month, so if it does happen, we're going to see it relatively soon. Okay, now we also got an update for PlayStation VR 2 on PC. Sony just unveiled the Steam PlayStation VR 2 app, which will go live on August 6th. Now, of course, in order to take advantage of this app, you will need to buy the PC adapter, which is 60 additional dollars. But I, I think that if you have a PlayStation VR 2, you've already invested a lot into it, and, and this will really unlock a lot of games that Sony was just unable to deliver themselves. Half-Life Alex as one such example. Now, I still think that there's flaws with how Sony is handling this PC adapter, uh, just because a lot of the features that makes the PSVR 2 special won't work while using this adapter. If Sony would have been smart about all of this, they would have designed the PSVR 2 with all of those features to work on both PC and the PlayStation 5 right out of the gate like fans originally wanted, and that would have really given them an edge over pretty much every other PC VR headset out there that relies on a wired connection to your computer. For that matter, if they would have been smart, they would have included backwards compatibility with the original PSVR headset, which that would have been very nice right now with Astrobot right around the corner. That game might raise a lot of interest in that VR Astrobot game, which I'll tell you firsthand is absolutely amazing, but that's kind of been the MO for the PSVR 2. Sony made a lot of mistakes with this device, and we're kind of seeing the results of all of that now, but hey, at the very least here, they are improving it with this PC adapter that you'll be able to purchase next month. All right, so let's go talk about this Xbox situation that just kind of feels like it's never-ending by this point. Like, like, this is honestly crazy, but apparently... The FTC versus the Microsoft Activision Blizzard acquisition isn't quite enough because the so-called gamers lawsuit is back with, quite frankly, a laughable case. And I want to explain why as we go through their filing. 
So let's go and put this up on screen here, and you can see. It says, Plaintiff Appellant's right to notify the court that Microsoft recently announced another price increase to its content subscription and cloud gaming product, Game Pass Ultimate, from $17 to $20 per month, a 17% increase. Microsoft communicated directly with Plaintiff Appellant, Owen, who is one of the more than 34 million subscribers to Game Pass. Microsoft informed him that his Game Pass subscription would be increasing in price for a second time. This price increase which is the second price increase since the district court denied plaintiffs' motions for preliminary injunction, raised the price of Game Pass to $20 per month. Prior to the district court's denial of plaintiffs' motion for preliminary injunction, the price of Game Pass Ultimate was only $15 per month. Thus, Microsoft's latest price increase establishes a 33% price increase since the district court allowed the merger to consummate before plaintiffs could be heard on the merits. The first price increase was a 13% price increase in September of 2024, which, by the way, is wrong. So we're already off to a bad start here with a careless mistake in their filing, but even ignoring that, we talked about this the other day while discussing the FTC and their case against Microsoft. As I said then, there's really not much of a case that they can make about this price increase because inflation right now is absolutely insane. Price hikes are not exclusive to Xbox Game Pass. Prices are raising across the board with everything. But even then, if we just talked about subscriptions and absolutely nothing else, well, guess what? The same thing still applies. Netflix, Amazon Prime, Max, and even PlayStation Plus have all raised their price. So if you just use simple logic, which I know is very hard for some people to do, but if you just use simple logic, you'll see that this is not an uncommon thing. But let's just go and continue on. They also said that the price increase is relevant to plaintiffs' appeal. It shows that plaintiffs are in fact suffering monetary harms that they asserted they would suffer and that their expert economists predicted. They said the day that the merger is consummated, the upward pressure on the price of AAA games will begin to be felt. As discussed in plaintiffs' appeal, the district court ignored this unrebutted expert evidence. Furthermore, Microsoft asserted to the district court in the related FTC action that there would be no price increases as a result of the merger. Microsoft said here the acquisition would benefit consumers by making Call of Duty available on Microsoft's Game Pass on the day it was released on console with no price increase for the service based on the acquisition. I'm going to go and repeat that last part. Quote unquote, based on. On the acquisition. The gamers' lawsuit literally contradicted themselves in their very own filing. What they did is they essentially provided proof to the court in their own filing that Microsoft did not strictly say that they won't raise prices. That's not what Microsoft said. If you read it correctly, Microsoft was very deliberate with their words, and they said that a price increase won't be because of the acquisition itself. So unless the gamers' lawsuit can somehow prove that the price increase was in fact a result of the acquisition, then this case has no leg to stand on, and that will be very difficult for them to do when we've seen inflation across the board and price increases for various subscription services, including their main competitor, PlayStation Plus. Like, that's all Microsoft has to do. They just have to point to PlayStation Plus and all these other subscriptions, talk about inflation, and say, yeah, this is why we did it. Like, this case is a complete waste of time. It's a waste of money, and it's a waste of effort. Now, I mean, at least when we talked about the FTC, you know, they're not hedging their entire argument on the price increase. That is a very weak argument for all of the reasons that I've already mentioned in a few different videos by this point. Rather, for them, they're also basing their accusation on a quote-unquote degraded Xbox Game Pass because Microsoft did, in fact, remove day one releases for that middle tier. Now, I still think that Xbox has some counterpoints to that argument, as we talked about in the previous video, but that will be a tougher thing for Microsoft to explain in court. Unlike last year, the FTC is not completely wrong this time. But as far as the gamer's lawsuit goes... 
It is crazy to me that this has somehow managed to stick around for this long. Like, like who exactly is funding this? I don't know, but uh, we'll, we'll see what happens with all this. My guess is that they'll probably be about as successful as they were last time. All right, so one last thing before we go. The tepid response for Concord just keeps getting worse and worse. The things that we already know is that the gameplay reveal trailer has 74,000 dislikes compared to just 6.8 thousand likes. By the way, it's new character trailers that they just revealed today. They're not faring much better. We also know that the open beta was unable to reach 2,500 concurrent players on Steam. Then on top of that, we know that its user reviews on PlayStation is a 2.85. So no, things are not looking great for Concord. But maybe, just maybe, there's more anticipation for this game than what we realize. Maybe, if we dig through the mountain of negative reactions that we've seen, just maybe, we'll find a large group that's really excited. Well, no, not so much, because thanks to the gamer, we now know where it sits on Steam's wish list and... Yeah, let's just go and check this out. They said, after pinpointing its location, I counted backwards and found that the title was well outside the top 750 games in the wishlist charts. An indictment, if there ever was one. Usually, a successful demo or beta will drive players to wishlist a title on Steam, reminding them to purchase it upon or close to release. This is something that Concord's recent open beta has evidently failed to do. The title's lowly position sees it behind games like the aptly named Dead on Arrival, Gato, Buttered Cat, and Gas Station's Simulator's Shady Dills DLC. Yeah, that doesn't really seem like a good sign. Like, there's a very good chance that Concord will be Dead on Arrival. And I just kind of keep asking myself, how in the world did Sony have this much confidence in Concord? I mean, they acquired Firewalk because of this game. And it's even getting its own limited edition controller. I mean, okay, the controller itself looks pretty good in my opinion. But as far as the game itself, the excitement is just not there. And the fact that it had an open beta and that still didn't move the needle, this could potentially be Sony's biggest first party flop of all time. I mean, who knows? Maybe it'll still come out and prove us all wrong. But if anything, I guess we'll find out next month when it releases on August 23rd. Anyways, though, that's going to be it for this episode, but until next time, subscribe, and peace out.